part of the University Community Conversation, or UC2, here at IPFW. This is a panel discussion on recent uh, events in Egypt and in Africa. We hope that you'll find it uh, as enjoyable as we think it's going to be. I want to mention very quickly the sponsors for this event are the American Democracy Project here at IPFW, Communication and Media Society, a student organization here, and then IPFW Center for Women and Returning Adults. Uh, I also want to thank CATV. They're the folks who are running the cameras here. You'll be able to see this on CATV eventually, and you'll also be able to find it on MDON thanks to the uh, Helmkey Library. Now, if you don't mind, I will introduce our panelists to you, starting immediately to my right, Jim Lutz, professor in the Department of Political Science. Next to him, Farrah Combs, who is a continuing lecturer in the Department of International Languages and Culture Studies. And then on the end down there, Awesome Nasser, assistant professor in the Department of Communications. Sorry, I did not roll my R enough for you on Nasser, but I'll work on that by the end. We have a series of questions we're going to ask them right up here up front to kind of get the conversation going. And then obviously we'll open it up to you all for questions from the audience. And we do appreciate you coming out. If you don't mind, Awesome, let's start with a couple of maps up here, get people oriented to where we are. Sure. Um, this is going to require me to stand up, so pardon me and my uh, silhouette here. Um, we're in Africa, right? This is it. This is Egypt. You can notice right here, this is the Red Sea, and this has been like quite a bit, uh, uh, you know, big question marks happening simply because, oh, look at this. This is where the ships carrying our oil that come all the way to our uh, gas stations, this is where they go through. So what is going to happen now that Egypt is kind of, uh, uh, quote unquote, a bit unstable? Um, North Africa, Arab countries over here, um, as well as over here, such as Yemen and Sudan. Um, Want to go to the next slide? So this is... A close-up, I guess, of, of Egypt. Cairo is right here by the star. And this is this little dot is the Suez, where the Suez Canal is. Um, the recent incidents have been taking place all over um, Egypt in many of these cities, uh, from Asyut to, uh, to the Suez city in Sina as well, which is the, uh, the uh, desert area right here, as well as uh, Al Fayyum and, of course, Alexandria and Cairo. This all started before Egypt. It all started in Tunisia, which is this country over here. And again, you notice this is North Africa again. So the proximity uh, to Europe, it has a lot of influence uh, uh, from the European uh, countries, specifically from France. And I guess we might be touching on that a little later. But um, all this turmoil started in Tunisia because of this one person who is kind of fed up of what's happening, he couldn't find a job. I guess I should be leaving this to, to Farah and, and, and Jim for that particular purpose. But we're, since we're explaining the map, um, again, things went completely out of hand for the regime in, in Tunisia, uh, for Zain al-Abidin bin Ali, uh, simply because once it started in Tunis, which is the capital city of Tunisia, um, it spread all over the cities, and before you know it, uh, it was a roller coaster from that point on. Uh, people took to the streets and claimed their rightful uh, position in, in uh, taking control over the country. Uh, next, I want to ask uh, Jim, the political structure in Egypt. What is the political structure? Is it a you know, two-party system, uh, presidential? Uh, give us a brief description of the political structure in Egypt so that people can get some understanding of what it will take for any sort of change or transition to take place. Well, Egypt is basically a presidential system, and President Hosni Mubarak is, of course, pretty much in charge. It has a legislature, which is pretty much a tame legislature. It does whatever is requested of it by the president. Uh, a handful of opposition party members have been in the parliament, uh, but not enough to seriously challenge the, the governing party, which is basically Mubarak's party. Uh, the Egyptian courts have actually been probably more active in challenging the president than the legislature ever has. The uh, Egyptian Supreme Court has a history of overturning election laws as being biased, discriminatory, and unfair. Uh, which uh, the government has accepted, but then it, and it changes the laws, but the next set of laws are just as biased, unfair, and discriminatory as the past ones. But uh, the judges actually have been able to criticize, perhaps carefully, and, and survive. Uh, the governing party is the only major party. Uh, opposition parties have never been able to get much off the ground. The government fears Islamic parties, so 
individuals who run as with parties affiliated with the Muslim Brotherhood have had to run as independents. They can't run under a party label of the Muslim Brotherhood or anything like it. So it, it's basically a modified one-party system. <coughs> Well, I think it's also going to be helpful if we have some idea of the social structure. This is this is a, a country with some fairly large extremes in terms of social structure. Yes. Farah, give us some understanding of the social structure of Egypt. Well, please. the social structure in Egypt, you have, of course, it's heavily populated, especially in Cairo. You have a good number of rich people, but very few compared to the percentage of the population. And you have poor people, a good amount of poor people, and the people in the middle are the majority. People that graduate, they go to school, graduate, can't find jobs, so there's higher numbers of unemployment, poverty. Uh, people that try to get married, they want to find a place to live, no place to live, and they get frustrated, of course. And all these people, the whole reason of this whole revolution, they want a better government, a better um, social life, of course, in Egypt, a better, a better um, accountability better economic justice and better human rights that they definitely lack in Egypt. So that is basically the sum of the social structure. And obviously we're talking really high unemployment. So what is the economic base for Egypt? What, where, you know, is it a man, it's not a manufacturing country, obviously. What is the economic we base? Have, they, there's a little bit of manufacturing in Egypt, but they rely heavily on tourism, uh, agriculture, where they have citrus fruits, corn, cotton. Egyptian cotton is, of course, is, uh, they, they export a lot of that. And um, they also in petroleum. Uh, products, but it's uh, mainly also in tourism. Tourism is heavily, uh, Egypt relies heavily on tourism. That's the main one, too. We know that there are elections coming up in September. What is an election typically like in Egypt? Do we, do we get nine months of campaigning there? <laughs> well, you don't have. Don't consider that to be a bad thing, by the way. <laughs> uh, well, the election results in the past have been predetermined. Uh, the question really is how many of the opposition candidates will be permitted to win seats. I think the government has usually been careful to make sure at least some get in, but has also been careful to make sure that the numbers are, are not too large. Uh, and, and the way in which the, uh, the governing party, the, uh, the party Mubarak, has all the advantages in terms of campaigning. And the Islamic parties, since they can't run as Islamic parties, mm -hmm. have to run independence, which makes it more difficult. Although the voters generally tend to know which candidates are associated with the Muslim Brotherhood, even if they don't have the label behind their names. So it's kind of a, a controlled situation, but there is opportunities for opposition candidates to express opposing points of view. and, and <coughs> and to actually make points, but persons who become uh, uh, too active in the opposition uh, sometimes find themselves in trouble with the police. They get arrested, at least in a temporary fashion. Mm. Now, are these, are these elections, uh, I don't want to use the term fixed, are they fixed because of the process, or are they fixed because of who's allowed to participate? In other words, is the process legitimate? If there were enough candidates running, would the process be something that people would look to and say, that's a good election? If I may, um, from my understanding, it's, it's an interesting process in the sense that who has access to what. Mm -hmm. uh, when you talk about the newspapers, when you talk about um, uh, the media, the, the television channels and radio channels, um, very little goes to opponents of the regime. So basically, Mubarak has sort of a monopoly um, over these media outlets. And what happens is all their news gets on and basically very little comes out from the other parties. Now, yes, we do have the Muslim Brotherhood. Yes, we do have other parties. Um, one of them has, has not gotten much attention, perhaps. They're known as kifaya. In other words, in Arabic, in, in English, that means enough. And they're kind of fed up with the regime and how it's been handling things. Um, there's something that has to be said about police brutality. There's something about clamming on other uh, uh, parties in the region, in the, in the state, uh, where you, know, you say something a little out of line, you're completely taken over and, and you're, you're put in jail. Uh, so that really restricts that kind of access as well to the people and to the public. Um, so that, that is one thing that I have to say about uh, uh, access. When it comes to elections, though, this is a very interesting times that we're living in, and I don't mean to jump ahead if I am, forgive me, but this is an interesting time because if Mubarak steps out, ste steps out of office, um, 
Egypt, according to the, what's it, the story in English? Constitution. Uh, the Constitution. Constitution, thank you. According to the Constitution, they only have about, not about, they only have 60 days to elect a new president. Mm -hmm. Now, the structure that has, at least to my understanding how it's been, is that it's so geared towards Mubarak. And remember, he's been in office for 30 years, so all the people in the government are pretty much, you know, his people. They're taking care of him, he's taking care of them. So 60 days, you elect somebody, even if it's not Mubarak, more likely it's going to be somebody, you know, related or somebody in bed with the policies and so on and so forth. I don't know, Jim, do you see it differently? <clears throat> that is the most likely outcome, but of course there are many possibilities within the inner circle in terms of who would come forward. Uh, the fact that uh, Omar Suleiman has become vice president, which gives him a leg up. It is a stepping stone and a, a figure of prominence that even if he's not seen as the primary candidate, he has an advantage. Anwar Sadat was vice president and everybody figured, okay, well, see how long he lasts before the real power comes through. And as it turned out, he was the real power and, and he stepped up and Mubarak mm -hmm. stepped up. There is at least within that context, a pattern of a vice president stepping up, which gives him an edge. Of course, since he's a involved with the secret police in the past, he may not be the preferred choice of many people in, in Egypt, but he may be the choice of, of the inner circle. And of course, since he's been involved in the secret police, he may have enough influence with the other members to influence them to come his way, given he knows where all the skeletons are buried. Yeah. Can we call Egypt typical of the region? Um, not, it's not an oil producer, it's more densely populated than most other countries, its level of education is relatively higher, its, its general level of poverty is somewhat lower. You, I mean, it's some political aspects, maybe in some countries it does apply, but it doesn't apply to the Gulf countries, it doesn't apply to um, mainly the Gulf countries, but to the way the government runs, you'll see some other governments in the Arab world that are kind of similar. Not to that extreme, maybe, but very similar. Awesome. I would hesitate to say that any country is typical in the Arab world. I mean, I'd echo what you, what you guys said, simply because they're, they're all unique in certain ways. They do have mm -hmm. so much in common. I think the frustration, I think the way uh, the powers that be in these states have something in common, which is kind of a monopoly over power. So if you look at Syria, you know, you have the, uh, I would call it the Assad dynasty because mm -hmm. it's transferred from father to son. And that's what we were about to see with Egypt where, uh, uh, you know, Hosni Mubarak was about to transfer his, the, you know, have an election, a very democratic election when you really don't have to show up. They'll do the voting for you. Um, that was a joke. Anyway, <laughs> okay, so, uh, what was going on here is that he's transferring this power to his son Jamal, uh, Gamal in the Egyptian dialect. And you see that in so many countries and so many other places uh, as well. And that is the sad thing. And this is why this event is very important for it to start in Tunisia and trickle over mm -hmm. to Egypt and have this kind of effect. Well, let's actually start from a big picture. What would you say is the cause of the unrest? From a big picture, we'll get to specific events in, in a moment here, but from a big picture, what is it? What's caused the unrest? The frustration of the Egyptians, the high numbers of unemployment, the um, economic just it's very injustice over in Egypt. Uh, there, people are frustrated because it's so not fair living there. There's a lot of pop people can't afford buying bread at some points. They, the president, he is a billionaire. Meanwhile, his people are starving and they don't have anything to eat. So there is a big. Um, I don't want to call him a dictator, but it's. Um, it's very s close to that, I would say. Awesome. So there's a lot of injustice. I think it uh, has also been exacerbated the, the general worldwide recession in West Europe and the United States that goes back to mm -hmm. 2008. Yeah, 2008, um, 2006, pardon me, the last two years of the Bush administration has had a, a, a negative effect everywhere and because major markets for Egyptian products are more in Europe, but somewhat in the United States, the downturn in demand has exacerbated the poverty and the differences. If, if your economy is picking up, even if ever so slowly, and even if there's great inequality in the system, 
as long as you can give everybody a little bit more, even if the people at the top take a whole lot more, you can, you can get, you can survive as a government. But when it starts to get worse and there's less, and then people start to realize not only are they not getting more, they're not even getting what they have, they're mm -hmm. getting less, that exacerbates the frustration that you talked about. Awesome. Um, I definitely think what you just stated, Jim and Farah, um, th these are the top things that, you know, it comes to the core of, uh, uh, you know, existence as a human being, your right to kind of live and live comfortably, or at least within a, a, a certain decency. Uh, but I also would add to that, it is an issue of identity at some point. There has been um, quite a sense of uh, inability among people to kind of express who they are as a people, as a culture. Um, again, it goes back, and maybe it's it's my own skewed vision that I see it from uh, uh, the perspective of, oh, the political elite versus the people. But in a way, that is, that is happening in the sense that you have those who are in power uh, take I don't know, the United Arab Emirates, take uh, Saudi Arabia, not to expand on other examples, but it's kind of very much an example of how these regimes are very much dependent on the West and Western states in order for them to exist, while not paying attention to the people's needs, while not really looking into uh, um, you know, how, how to uh, address these issues. People have a certain identity and a cultural pride that they really want to you know see as a nation of the nation as a nation state as as Egypt uh, they want to feel that we can exist we can sustain our existence based on our hard work and not really have uh, politicians who are uh, uh, you know collaborating with uh, Westerners or, or uh, other states like the Soviet Union in the 80s and what have you in order for us to to exist and, and be who we are so this is why you have pockets of dissidents this is why you have pockets of people who are trying to establish that we want Egypt for the Egyptians we want Tunisia for for the Tunisians if, if, oh, sorry, go ahead. if I may add it's uh, of course, I agree with uh, with both of you. I want to also say that Egypt is such a great country. The Egyptian is they they have accomplished so much in history, and they really want freer opposition. They don't they don't have that. Um, it's Mubarak regime, and basically that's what it is for the past thirty years. So there's no uh, people can't kind of uh, elect and choose someone else. They kind of get shut down to that, and they get jailed. They, it's, it's, they need freer opposition. And I also wanted to add a point, and I lost track. My, I forgot what I was going to add, but oh well, hopefully I'll can I Can I just there. add, can I add Maybe with an example, if I may? Go sure. ahead. Uh, uh, talking about Egypt and how well they've done and what they've produced, it is amazing for me to see that once upon a time in the 50s, 60s, and a little less in the 70s, how Egypt was a cultural hub for the Arab world and for the region mm -hmm. in, in itself. Their film industry was just impeccable. It was amazing. They had some great cultural power to the region. Their uh, a system of academic, I mean, they had, uh, um, you know, a great output of literature uh, and culture, and then all of a sudden it's been reduced after three, 30 years to, you know, shutting people off and having a brain drain from Egypt for people going to, in, in exile, kind of mm -hmm. not doing much. This has really harmed the country, this has really harmed the culture. Obviously, the situation is, is not good. It's been getting bad for several years now. If you picked one event, is there one thing that you think set off the events we've seen here? Is there one event, one happening, one statement that you think has set the last week or so in motion? Oh, definitely. I would say Tunisia, what happened in Tunisia. That kind of gave it the ripple effect throughout the world, uh, the Arab world in the region. So it kind of gave, it was a model to the Egyptians to kind of say, okay, we can do it. We are, we're going to unite, unite together. We can get our country um, to what we want it to be. And if I may add a little bit to that is, uh, now I remember what I wanted to say, the Egyptians' goal versus Hosni Mubarak's goal, I believe they're kind of separate. The Egyptians are doing what they're doing. They're sacrificing their lives for Egypt and the Egyptians. What he is doing, he his, he's seeing his people die day after day, and by what I think is his doing, and he is not doing anything about it just staying still. So that kind of gives you a, a, an idea, well, what is his goal versus the Egyptians and what they're doing? They're working hard for their country versus so being awesome selfless. So a single event that you think triggered things? 
that is very hard for me to pinpoint. I think definitely Tunisia. it was the catalyst that Tunisia, you know, I mean, I don't mean to say keeping up with the Joneses, <laughs> but if the Tunisians were able to, to you know, if they, they can, why can't we? Why can't we? Sure. And they had. They tried to, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, there was uh, the Kifaya movement uh, started, you know, uh, 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 demonstration. Many people were jailed. Many people mm -hmm. were jailed. You know, I think that was in 2006, Five. if I'm... 2005. 2005. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm, I'm a little sketchy <laughs> on the dates. But people were just released, like, you know, within the past uh, three days. Uh, so it can give you a magnitude. I don't know what Jim thinks. I, I agree with Tunisia. It's... Uh, it, it's a, a trigger in a way. Uh, of course, Tunisia's transition f away from the from the authoritarian regime was easier. Tunisia has always been a much more open society. It has much better political institutions, mm -hmm. interest groups, and things of that nature. Uh, less authoritarian past. And although Ben Ali was a general, he didn't come to power through any kind of military action. He was the last prime minister when Burkiba was quietly removed from power because he was too old to govern. And so T Tunisia has a, a more peaceful past. In, it, it doesn't have the same kind of history as Egypt for the past, for 50 years of independence. Mm -hmm. And it's been more popular, there has actually been more popular involvement and more avenues for political participation in Tunisia than in Egypt. So Tunisia went very quickly, and I think the Egyptians are expecting much of the same process, but the Egyptian system is much more deeply entrenched behind Mubarak, and it's going to take more than two weeks yeah. for it to change. We've, we've heard several names here today. Who are, if we're trying to identify the most important players to know in what's going on, who would we put into that category? Who's your, who's your top five, I guess, I'm asking? Um. Uh, uh, what's going on? Players Egypt? in Egypt, yes. Well, the vice, who was just appointed the vice president, Omar Suleiman, is one. Jim, who else would you add? Uh, not being an expert on Egyptian political opposition, it's hard. It, the persons who will become important and the players behind the scenes, obviously, nameless generals in the army will have an opportunity to influence whatever the outcome is. And I, I don't presume to know which generals are, are the most important because they've been staying in the background for all the years. But any outcome that looks extremely dangerous to the military might bring about some kind of military involvement. Not necessarily a military coup, but simply to say, this person is not acceptable, you have to look elsewhere. Mm -hmm. I, I think of anything, I mean, we do have some interesting fresh names to, uh, as, as candidates. Um, one of whom, I mean, I'm sure if you've been following the news, uh, Al Baradi, who mm -hmm. was the, uh, he's a Nobel laureate. Uh, Leader of the know, National Association. For, yep. Yeah. Um, and uh, more recently, we had uh, Amr Musa, who is the head of the Arab League. Uh, speaker of the Arab League, and basically he just joined in the demonstration and said, I'll be ready to, to go for president if that's the case, which is a, an, an incredible step on his behalf. It kind of tells you that there is a shift, so people are kind of, the world around at least is kind of losing hope about Mubarak staying in the regime, and he's basically, they're, they're waiting for the downfall, although that is uncertain till this very point. Yeah. And also there's, speaking about Kifaya, the mm -hmm. movement Kifaya, yeah. there's the guy who got arrested. Um, I only remember uh, his, his last name, Noor. I can't mm -hmm. remember his first name, but he could be also one of the people that we can keep and we can think he might do something, some effect in this regime change. It's interesting. We're talking about a small number of people, really, in the yes. grand scheme of things. And much has been made about the fact that a small number of people are, are organizing these thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people. Are we making too much of the fact that it's a small group of people who are organizing this? If I may be, I'm a little skeptical that it is a small number of people. Yeah. Um, my understanding is that it was a very involuntary, uh, you know, reaction to what's happened, to, to what's going on, and basically people just took to the streets and that was it. Um, I'm very curious if you look at uh, sort of a cross-section of the people who are there, the diversity is 
amazing. Um, it's rich people, uh, people who are underpaid, you know, the, the, the baker who doesn't make uh, enough to feed his family versus, uh, you know, the business person who basically cannot get his work done because of, uh, you know, the restrictions and all of that. It's a very interesting uh, amalgamate of the Egyptian society um, that has, you know, gone to the streets. Uh, I know, Awesome. You are a person of technology. You you tweet. You uh, you do all those things. I don't know how to do, and and uh, I applaud you for that. I, I do not tweet. Do I'm, not I'm tweet. kind of I'm an observer. An observer. Of <laughs> I tweets. haven't tweeted I yet. I apologize. You're an observer <laughs> of tweets. Uh, are, what is what is uh, access to the internet like? What is access to cell phones like? Uh, are the are these uh, big consumers and users of this technology? Uh, cell phones, definitely. Uh, I know that 90% of the Egyptian population, adult Egyptian population, carry cell phones. That does not mean that they all tweet and, and do Facebook on their cell phones or access the internet. Um, I have a slide, if you don't mind just pulling that up. So, no, the one before, just a little, there we go. Um, so, we have Egypt 71.4. Uh, literacy rate and we have 83 million people uh, um, you know as a population for the country now 20 20 million of these 83 million who are adults basically are internet users whether through cell phones or through regular computers so if you look at this uh, um, you know in terms of percentage of the 83 that's almost uh, uh, that's almost quarter of, of the population, and we're talking about 20 million who are adults, and 83 does not really say that they're all adults, of course. Um, but we see that, that, yes, we have an increasing form uh, where people, I mean, internet cafes have mushroomed like crazy in Cairo, Alexandria, Siwa, uh, you name the city, it, they're there. And it's, it's a big business to have that. Um, this also tells you something about the use of internet and the use of media when Mubarak, the first thing that he does is completely cut off cell phones, completely cut off internet uh, uh, access. And of course, it's the internet. You cannot stop it. People still had access. Somehow they managed it and it worked for them. Is this, uh, we talked yesterday about this, uh, is it the internet that's really sort of driving this or, or is this simply driving the train faster? What's the role that the internet's actually playing in this? I hesitate and, and to social yeah. network, not right, 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 right. generally, generically. Just technology yeah. in general. Yeah. Um, it's definitely a factor. It's definitely a tool that has helped and assisted people in getting information uh, disseminated and getting, uh, you know, rallying support and getting people to, to kind of mobilize and, and get on the streets. Um, I think it's the human element behind this tool that causes all of this. And I think we were just talking about this yesterday. Uh, I don't know if Jim and Farah had, had have anything to add to that. It uh, clearly the events in Tunisia were known in Egypt very quickly. If you go back 50 years, 30 years, the government would have had time to prepare for adverse consequences of unrest in a neighboring country because they would have gotten the information in advance of the population. Now everybody gets the information at the same time. You don't have to wait for the diplomatic courier, which is right. is 36 hours out of date by the time you get it. And only the few get it, right? Yeah. So it's, it's also helped to spread the knowledge of what is going on elsewhere. And, uh, and so that folks in Cairo know what's going on in Alexandria and elsewhere in the country as well. It, do we get the feeling that uh, the plan is for, for Mubarak is to simply wear down, wait out, uh, are the demonstrators starting to wane in their in their zeal? Is this a legitimate strategy? Is this what we think is going to happen, Jim? Farah, anybody? I th I think it it could be happening. I don't think it's so much a question of Mubarak wearing down the opposition and then continuing on. I think he is almost forced, at the very least, to to step down in September, not run again. That handwriting is on the wall. But for the inner circle, they might prefer to wear down the opposition so they can be better prepared for September and agree on who the next president is going to be well before the election and then hold the election. Well, I do want to ask this one last question before we open it up because we we're going to do about 30 minutes up here. Uh, what's coming next? You have to predict now. That's the easiest question of the day, right? What's That's coming next? That's the easiest next? question. In my opinion, I think he's definitely going to He's not going to be the president next time, you know, come September. But I do believe that he is not, he's going to go to Germany, I believe, for some 
surgery or some, I'm not sure exactly what it is, but he's going to Germany, he's leaving Egypt, and I don't think he will be back anytime soon. And of course his son is not gonna be the president because they decided that, and he's no longer the, the one who's in charge of the <laughs> national, uh, or the National Democratic Party. So of course he's not gonna be the president. Um, I do think that I don't think they're going to have a president anytime soon for the long term. They might have a temporary, like an interim president, until September, and then they will do an actual election by September. So it's kind of, you know, like what you said, basically. Jim? Uh, well, uh, Suleiman can take over as the vice president while he's mm -hmm. out. He doesn't officially resign, so the vice president acts in his capacity, mm -hmm. which helps set the stage. I think that the the Egypt, the Egypt to follow, regardless of who who is the new president, will be a more open society and more participatory. I think that I keep referring to the inner circle, but they realize that any elite that survives has to realize when they have to adapt and make changes, and, and that is obviously clear that changes are necessary. Awesome. Um, I'm honestly, I, I, it could go either way, but my main concern and my uh, uh, hope is, or my my prediction, I'd like to think about what happens if he does, he is deposed off from office, uh, or whether he is or he isn't. Uh, let me say that in English one more time, pardon me. Um, if he's out of office, what are the effects to the Arab world? I think if we draw that to the entire region, adverse effects, fantastic uh, changes will happen, simply because you have people who, who are uh, uh, able and capable of taking in uh, the responsibility and, and you know elect somebody to office from their own. And of course, there's no assurances here. It's not a guaranteed thing of how things will go because there are so many factors in play. But if anything, Tunisia caused, uh, uh, you know, Jordan, uh, Yemen, um, Mauritania, and, and Algeria, you people to go to the streets and, 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 you know, take charge. Of course, nothing has happened except for in Egypt. It kind of went out of control as we're seeing right now. But I think if Mubarak does get out of office because of this revolution, um, things are, look very bright for, for uh, the rest of the region, for the rest of the peoples uh, around uh, uh, in the Arab world. And that can only mean that, you know, perhaps we'll be looking forward to people's participation, a more people or populist based government, uh, things that would look for their interests more than, you know, a particular person or party. So we'll have you all back in October to tell us whether you were right or wrong. <laughs> well, well, yeah. Questions from the audience. Yes, Dean. What influence has the rise in food, food prices globally uh, had in leading up to instability? Generally, increased food prices have a negative effect in, there have been bread riots and food riots in the Middle East many times in the past when, they've tr when governments faced with problems have tried to raise the prices of basic food. It has, it has generated a protest in larger numbers than perhaps anything else would. And it, it said this is a, probably part of the, there have been bread riots in, in Egypt as well. So this has helped set the stage. It's not, it's a cumulative effect. And they've had, they've had the same kinds of problems in Tunisia, which would lead to the, the people remember and they, and the, the hard, it is economic hard times because of problems in West Europe and the United States. And that, that has helped focus the unrest with the government, I think. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Okay. Next question. In the back. Could you expand on the role of the Egyptian military and the fact that they really haven't been directed to the streets by the government, that they're kind of a, a third party in all of this that's going on? I, I believe that they were supposed to, they were sent to protect the people. So when they were told, that's according to the media, of course, when they were told that to start you know, using fire against these, uh, the, the protesters, the riots, um, the military refused because their main job is to protect the people. And they're the ones who've been helping instead of, like, unlike the police, the police are the ones who've been against the rioters and they're the ones who've been um, basically clashing with the demonstrators. I don't know if, that, if you want to add no, to that. I, I think the military is, again, it's, this is a, it's guesswork, but it's playing a waiting game Clearly, siding with Mubarak seems like a bad option. Mm -hmm. in, in 1979, initially, the military sided with the Shah on Iran, and that didn't work out terribly well. 
and it, it had negative repercussions for people in the military. Um, Mubarak is, I think, from their perspective, a lost cause. Uh, Mubarak is a former general. He was an Air Force general. And that made him an ideal vice president for Sadat, who was in the army, because Air Force generals are in the Egyptian context. Naval admirals wouldn't constitute a greater threat because they don't command troops. And so Mubarak was was a good vice president since he didn't have troops. But he, he is an Air Force general, which means that even though he's been in power for 30 years, his linkages to the army, which is really the basic deciding force in Egypt, are bound to be weaker. He doesn't go, he was in a separate branch of the armed forces. So they're probably somewhat less likely to support him than they might have been if, if it was one of their own. Even though he has close ties, they're looking to the future and to engage in, in a bloodbath to preserve somebody in power who is, who's been around for 30 years and is as old as Mubarak, the, the cost and benefits don't weigh out for them very well. Yeah. And one thing, if I may add to that, is that we have to remember that uh, the army is different than the police. Mm -hmm. The police are being paid to kind of control the, the, the security on a daily basis for the past whenever they were you know, uh, instituted, as long as they were in power. Uh, the army, on the other hand, is kind of to protect the people from external forces. 40, what is it, 48,000 reserve troops, that's according to Al Arabiya, the satellite channel. Um, and imagine that, like, you know, they are part of the families, they are part of the people who are on the streets. Uh, you might expect some form of mutiny if you actually turn the army against the people on the streets because they too are living through the same uh, uh, regime. They're, they're, they're getting the, the effects of that as well. We'll go here first, then there, and there, then there. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you guys talked about like how this is kind of like a start and maybe air, other air countries. What country do you think would be next maybe to upright? Because I know um, I mean, Palestine has its issues, but then like Jordan, you know, the King Abdullah kind of sells out the country to different people. Um, Kuwait's kind of in a different world. Iraq's kind of done with. What do you think's gonna, who's next? Do you think that's gonna maybe? I was really hoping nobody would ask that question. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Benny. Well, that means you have to answer it first. Uh, I would, I'll give it. To I would Jim. probably go with Jordan. Uh, the, the Arab monarchies in the peninsula are, able to deal with dissent through the use of financial resources, which are considerable. Um, other countries uh, in, in Syria, uh, the uh, Assad dynasty is quite capable of dealing with dissent, not through the use of money, but because of control. They're in, firmly in control. And places like Lebanon and Algeria already are fairly open in some respects, and Morocco as well. So. Libya, which is right next door, would be uh, problematic, except that Gaddafi seems to be in control. Although, he also seems to be planning to turn power over to his son, which may not seem like such a good idea anymore. And, and Libya, of all the countries in the Middle East, <laughs> since it's sandwiched between Egypt and, and Tunisia, would probably... I'm going to change and go with Libya as the country most likely to be affected. <laughs> Geography and the influence, Tripolitania, uh, the area around Tripoli is very culturally similar to Tunisia. The western part is more similar to Egypt. Uh, if I were sitting in Gaddafi's seat right now, he probably feels like he's getting it from both directions, which unlike any place else. And we'll ask Jim that question again at the end, just to see if he changes the question again. But mind you, I mean, this is probably why you heard Gaddafi as soon as the Tunisian uh, revolution like was uh, on its way and all that. It's like, I do not approve of what the people are doing. This is not good. I'm like, gee, I wonder why. Hmm. I would all think right. Libya more than Jordan, just because Jordan is still, it's, it's a kingdom. So it's run a little bit different. But probably, if I were to guess, I would probably agree with Libya more. So, do any of you have any idea what the atmosphere is like outside of Cairo? Is there more or less uncertainty? It's, I mean, in Egypt, but outside of Cairo? Right. From, from what I know, from, again, I get it from the media and from some family members, but there are in Cairo, uh, it's, there are protesters outside of Cairo. It's not just in Cairo. It's 
different areas in Egypt, but it's concentrated in Tahrir Square. It's in mainly in Cairo. Uh, but still, people are now, not like the first few days of the revolution, they're kind of going back to work. They're still, they still want to go to work, kind of no schools yet, mm -hmm. as far as I know. But they're trying to live as normal as possible, considering the circumstances and the situation in Egypt. But there are some um, demonstrations outside of Cairo too. Um, I guess going back to a question that we had earlier, um, just to answer yours, is like, is he trying, is Mubarak trying to wear the people down? Because yes, obviously, things need to go back to normal at some point. People need to buy bread. People need to, you know, go about their daily business. Um, so I guess what's happening at this point is, as I've heard from uh, the news sources from the Arab world, is that yes, banks have opened yesterday. Mm -hmm. uh, businesses are running on very light uh, kind of manner. But on the other hand, the protesters have taken that into consideration. And what they actually did was they planned, let's do Tuesday and Friday, have big, massive demonstrations. And the last time I checked on Al Jazeera this morning, uh, the, the, the little marquee said that something around the figure of a 1 million people showed up to Tahrir, which I was really surprised because as of yesterday, I was thinking, oh, goodness, this is dying. Uh, the revolution is kind of uh, winding down. I don't know. Just to add to this, the the I saw an image on TV. I believe it was on Al Jazeera. It was the prettiest thing I saw. The whole revolution is for the demonstrators. You saw. I saw. It was on a Friday prayer, I believe. Oh, mm -hmm. sorry, Sunday prayer. You saw or Sunday mass. Uh, you saw the Coptic Christians. They are praying. You know, doing the mass of Sunday mass, and then surrounded, like in a circle around them, are the Muslims, uh, kind of protecting them from whatever you know, from really the police and the um, people that are against them. And after they were done, after the Christians were done, then you saw the Muslims do their prayer. And what sh what it shows is, it's not an Islamic revolution, like some people mm -hmm. tried early on. Some other media channels Mubarak tried to say that. Mubarak tried to frame it. Exactly. So it's not an Islamic revolution. They're kind of working together as Egyptians, trying to better their country, not as two separate groups in Egypt. There was a hand over there and then one way in the back. And fine. Okay, we'll go to the back then. You ended on a... Uh, a little louder. Sorry. Um, you ended the presentations on a somewhat, um, on a somewhat positive note, and I guess um, as a less, perhaps as a less optimistic person, um, I wanted to, um, there, there were a couple of things that you mentioned that I found were really interesting. Um, you mentioned the, the important role that sort of the, the quest for um, proper expressions of identity plays in all of this, which sounds like there's a fair, potentially very, fairly strong anti-Western sentiment um, embedded within, uh, within the movement. Uh, you met, we mentioned the fact that there's a wide range of motivations uh, for why people are involved, including the desire for improved um, economic conditions, but also the desire for human rights. And so if we're thinking about the, um, the potential outcome, it's, and, and it's the potential, um, you know, as a historian, I keep thinking, well, I, can't, I couldn't think of a single example where movements with a strong anti-Western sentiment ended up in in the, with the establishment of democratic regimes that have a tremendous amount of respect for human rights. Um, the, and there also seems to be there's a tension between a populist regime and, again, a regime that um, has respect for human rights. Because you can have um, populist regimes with, without those things. And so I'm, I guess I'm just curious, where, with so many different forces um, contributing to this, where, where, which one do you think is, you know, which one do you think is going to potentially win out? May I start just at least with the identity part, if I may? Um, thank you for this question. This is really, really very good and key question. Um, in terms of identity and what the people are trying to say, <coughs> pardon me, I think it's an issue of maintaining an identity of a local culture. Mm -hmm. We would like to see ourselves as Egyptians, as Tunisians, as Iraqis and all that. I think the people are very much afraid of having this cultural aspect of this country or their culture to kind of uh, uh, be watered down. Um, this happens all over. It's not Arab versus West. It's not, uh, you know, China versus Britain or so on. It's, it's all over, right, because of, you know, transportation, media communication, and so on and so forth. Um, a big part of what's happening is that it's not pretty much against the West. It's against the leaders 
being so dependent mm -hmm. on the West. It's about sustenance. It's about having the dignity that we as a people, and I'm quoting you know, what the Egyptians might say, we would like to know that we are actually able to live our lives based on our own uh, uh, you know, handwork, handiwork, based on our own crops without really having to depend so much on the foreign uh, uh, kind of aid going to the president who, who kind of takes advantage of that and, and you know, cashes in the money. Um, I don't think, and there's some, I feel, at least as a citizen of the Arab world, I feel that there's some sort of a misconstruction of how the people in the Arab world think towards the West. It's not about, oh, we don't like the West. It's more about, no, we need to coexist with two identities. Uh, except that, why does it have to happen on, you know, on, uh, 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 at the expense of this very local identity. So I guess in every culture, not necessarily Arab or not necessarily religiously uh, driven, uh, it happens. Sadly, some communities have taken it to the extreme because that was an opportunity. At least that's from my very own opinion. I don't know if you agree or disagree with me I on that. Agree. I agree. I think in part two, the, it's not no human rights or full human rights. It's very possible that, that what Egypt looks like a, a year from now won't be a fully functioning democracy. I think the, the more relevant question, a less optimistic question to, uh, would, or a less optimistic outlook, is that whether or not there is greater respect for human rights in Egypt a year from now. There clearly isn't a huge amount. I mean, Egypt is not one of the most dictatorial totalitarian regimes in the world that with a matter of course, massacres its own citizens or mm -hmm. things of this nature. But if you look at it from the perspective of a year from now, it has moved in a greater direction towards greater respect for human rights, even if it's not a fully functioning democracy, then that's been an improvement. So it's not all or nothing. Next question. Yes. And then to the back, sorry. I, I know that Egypt is like one of the only countries in the Middle East that has like relations with Israel, so how do you think that'll affect that country? If like, we got it just taken out of office and someone else is elected, what do you think will happen? Like, it's not the only country. Uh, uh, many countries. Yeah, many countries, yeah. but it, it seems to be the more one prominent the in the one. news, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, Regardless of his domestic policies, Mubarak has been a moderating force in relationships with Egypt and Israel and with other Arab countries. Uh, usually relations between Israel and Egypt are uh, termed correct, meaning we don't really like each other, but we agree to disagree and we work with each other as we have. And Mubarak has been admittedly very successful in putting forward plans and because he had influence with the Israeli government when he put forward a plan it got more attention in Tel Aviv than it would if somebody else had come forward with it. He has at various times helped smooth over some problems between the Palestinian leadership and Israel. So I think from the Israeli perspective Mubarak's departure from power in Egypt, and that seems to be clear, is, is going to be a negative because there will probably be a tendency for whoever else who comes to power. You're not going to generate much popular support in Egypt by being pro-Israel, but as a politician you can generate uh, popular support by taking a less pro-Israeli stance than Mubarak did. So mm -hmm. it's probably going to be a, a a net disadvantage for Israel. To the back. I'm wondering how good a job you think the U.S. Uh, government has done in handling the crisis. And obviously there are two issues here. One, U.S. foreign policy interests. And two, any effects that it might have had on the ground in Egypt? I like the fact that the U.S. is with the people not with the president at this point because uh, one the president is it's inevitable that he is going to be gone uh the people on the other hand they're not they're gonna it's, it's, it's of course but um i i basically basically i agree and i'm happy that america is with the people and not with the president on this and the second part of your question you said is would it helping or hurting I don't know about that. Words, you I would can answer both from the U.S. perspective and from the perspective of Egyptians looking at U.S. foreign policy. 
passing of death? All I know from, at least from this side uh, of, uh, of it, is that I've heard something recently on NPR is that uh, the administration is not very happy with the intelligence uh, uh, factor going on in Egypt, what's happening on the ground, which makes it really difficult for the administration today to kind of figure out where do we stand on this? Um, I'm not sure if the administration is very clear on where they are, uh, whether they're supporting the people or not. They're kind of walking a very thin line. And as things come clearer, they're kind of moving towards the people because they have been on the streets for that long. Um, from the Egyptian side, I feel from the tweets that I've read, uh, especially following on, you know, Clinton's, uh, uh, you know, declaration of, you know, this or that or the other, uh, there are a lot of question marks. My take, my understanding is that people are confused by America's stand with the people, if it is with the people right now, because they couldn't really understand that this is a country. The United States is a state, is a nation that is founded on human rights, on freedom of speech, on ability to participate, on democracy. Yet, when it comes to a state like Egypt, they really supported an interest which does not fall in the line of the ideology that the American people follow. Whatever happened to people's participation in the regime or in the rule, I shouldn't call it regime, in the rule, in, in the democracy, uh, democratic process. So that is what, what's so confusing. And I think uh, some might be a little, you know, taken aback by, oh, it's basically you turn with the page, right? It's like, you know, whatever serves your interests, you go for it. And that's kind of a little, uh, um, confusing for people, to well, say the least. I think part of it, too, is if you look at the U.S. foreign policy strictly from an Egyptian perspective, that may well be true, but the administration cannot look at it strictly from an Egyptian perspective. Absolutely. The support for Mubarak has been present in the past because he's been useful. He's actually facilitated peacemaking in a number of contexts. He has been better than the possible alternatives in some cases and democracy was not a viable alternative. But any administration has to be aware of, if you abandon an ally too precipitously, every other ally starts to get concerned about your willingness to support them. So if you focus, well, here's the Obama administration, here's Egypt, and nothing else matters, but everything else does matter. And actually, I think the administration has done a reasonable job of walking a tightrope, leaving its options open, uh, indicating to, I, I think, the kind of public indications to Mubarak that massive repressive violence is not appropriate mm -hmm. is not that we're interfering, but we think that this would be a bad idea for you, is diplomatic speak, but it, it's, it's hedging bets, admittedly, but it's, it, it's not trying to e easing his way out as opposed to pulling right. the rug out from under him. But with the same token, see, I, I, I totally appreciate that, and it's absolutely true, but with the same token, it makes me wonder, um, why is it that we need to give full support to an ally without kind of questioning their kind of, uh, you know, uh, right, or what they're doing, what their practice is? I mean, historically speaking, not about the Arab world, uh, Pinochet to Noriega to uh, uh, you name it. I mean, you know, the, the, the plenty of examples, you know, and somehow we end up kind of turning around and say, oh, goodness, we supported uh, Saddam Hussein, but now he's an enemy. He's, he's evil. Let's uh, tear him down. And you kind of wonder, it's like, okay, consistency here. Uh, why is it that we don't really look at, you know, uh, uh, the philosophy behind a, a particular rule and kind of, are we really looking for the bottom line that we watch out for our people in terms of uh, how free they are and kind of watch that with our allies as well. I kind of messed it up here, kind of well, got a little part, excited, but course, yeah. The, the, the issue wasn't 30 years ago Mubarak or democracy. So, True, yes. So you, you, you have to make choices, and sometimes the choice, any country in foreign policy has to make choices, and it's not between good and evil, it's between evil and really evil <laughs> in some cases, but the tr doing nothing is a choice as well. Yes. And so, so you are forced into that choice. But at least call him on it. And, yeah. and Mubarak has had a state of emergency for, yeah. you know, almost all his, uh, pretty much all, right? There are off several, off, off off. several hands starting to go up, and we are winding down in our time available. So uh, be as brief as possible with your question and brief as possible with your answer. 
And we start here, then there, then there, then there, then there, in front. I gotta get through them all. So right there, please. Does the United States stand a chance to repair its image in the Islamic world by how it reacts to Egypt, or is that not gonna play? I mean, are, is our image more severely tainted than anything there could ever? I think it warrants a distinction. There's uh, American politics and American people. By no mean whatsoever uh, do uh, people and I say that generally and I shouldn't, but I get the impression that by no means it is against the American people, but it's the American policy. Yeah. To answer your question, I have no idea because there's a lot of pockets of, of these you know, policy uh, uh, actions, but I leave it to you. Uh, what do you think? Um, I don't see it, the United States being portrayed as being anti-Islamic in this particular issue. So I don't think it's going to have much influence. You said it in the Islamic world as opposed to the Middle East. I don't think this is going to either greatly improve or lead to a deterioration in the image of the United States in the Islamic world. Tom. Yeah. Um, New York Times a couple of days ago had an article on Turkey perhaps being a model for Egypt of democratic, prosperous, military still got a role. Um, is that likely, and does that mean maybe Turkey is going to be a very influential player in the region, or are there barriers to Turkish influence that would make you think that things are going to happen more idiosyncratically in every country? Mm -hmm. I don't think Turkey is a particularly good model because part of what Turkey is today is 50 years of history. And Egypt doesn't have that 50 years of history. I mean, it, it's led up, there's been three at least three major military interventions along the way. So Egypt isn't at that stage. I don't think the Turkish model is, is as good a model, and the Turkish economy is much more diversified than the Egyptian economy. Uh, I, I would have to go with more idiosyncratic than Turkey as a model. I would say the same. I don't, I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't believe that it's the Sorry. best model to use. To the back. Final question, everyone. Sorry about that. I was just wondering if um, uh, you all see any relevance as far as like WikiLeaks or the Palestinian papers, uh, either in terms of the, the protests on the ground or in terms of how state, uh, American foreign policy has played out. Not, not in any particular <coughs> dramatic fashion. Uh, the WikiLeaks and people who have looked at them in detail are more people who are deeply into foreign policy making or people who just like the disclosure mm -hmm. part of it. Um, and those, so far as I know, have not been uh, tremendously uh, translated and transmitted to the Middle East. So I don't think a major impact, though marginally. I think many, many of what's happened with the WikiLeaks, uh, with the le latest uh, uh, releases and so on, that's not something very new to the people. Um, let me put it this way. People have incredible mistrust of the governments. They have incredible mistrust of the mouthpieces for the government, so state televisions and so on. And this is why it's word of mouth, and you have a lot of these things happening or taking place uh, being heard of on the street rather than through media, except for when Al Jazeera comes up with a report about uh, the negotiations over between uh, you know Palestinians and Israelis. That kind of brought some new light uh, to, to things. Um, but if anything, looking at the internet and the media technologies and how you know, people themselves have used them, I mean, this really allowed for a lot of these leaks to happen from within, not necessarily through the website or through the web service of WikiLeaks. Um, I had some examples that I wanted to show, but we're way out of time. Yeah. Well, first, let's give them all a round of applause, please. Thank you. Panelists were from the Department of Communication, Awesome Nasser from Department of International Language and Culture Studies, Farrah Combs, and from the Department of Political Science, Jim Lutz. Please make sure that you pick up your copy of On Liberty and take part in the book discussion as part of the UC2 series. And I want to thank our sponsors once again, the American Democracy Project, IPFW Center for Women and Returning Adults, who fed some of you, but apparently not all of you since we didn't buy enough. And then Communication and Media Society. Special thanks to Andy as well yes. for helping so much and for, for uh, helping with the organization. This is amazing.